Hi, my name is Tyler and welcome to Sector T Studios. I am so excited to get this project started. Here's a little bit of what I do. I've got two goals here. I'm a composer and producer, and what I want to be doing is writing music for video games and animation and for whatever else I can get my hands on. So I want this to be like a living portfolio, basically. I want to write music, I want to share it with you guys, and I want to be collaborative with it. I want to work with other musicians and visual artists and anybody else that's interested in doing a mixed media project of some kind, like I want to do it. Um, I'd love to do contests and competitions and challenges and, and whatever other things we find that are fun. So I'm going to be launching a Discord with the channel. Um, it's going to start out as kind of a Discord blob as we, you know, kind of figure out what people are interested in, what you want to be, you know, going over in videos, what you want to see, and then we'll kind of, you know, focus it in more from there and see where it goes. I have no idea where it's going to take us, and that's very much the exciting part of this. So that's part number one. Part number two is that behind me, I'm sure you've noticed, I've got three racks full of what I would consider the best of the 1990s. And I would love to bring everybody through each one of these devices, how they work, and especially in a modern hybrid setup. And um, their kind of unifying you know, origin in my rack is that each one of these was used in one way or another to make the instrument sounds for various video games, um, usually from the 90s to the 2000s, uh, but also you know from other time periods as well. And I've had so much fun learning about each one of these things, learning what you know what libraries are available seeing what they can really do in action and then how they combine into a modern rig so for today i wanted to start with something really special because it's a beginning in a few different ways today we're going to talk about digi designs sample cell and this one took a long time to track down actually because a lot of information wasn't available until recently but basically sample cell is a sample playback platform it was on new bus or pci cards that went in 90s max had about 32 megabytes of memory 32 simultaneous voices of playback and eight outputs and so it was a very powerful sampling platform when combined with like a Pro Tools TDM rig or a DigiDesign audio media card and uh, really was an amazing kind of alternative to a standalone sampler something like an Akai S1000 or S3000 and its big claim to fame for me is that it was used heavily by Koji Kondo and the team at Nintendo during the golden era of Nintendo 64 games to create their sound banks and instrument sounds so games like Mario 64, Star Fox 64 and The Legend of Zelda Ocarina of Time and Majora's Mask. I started this hunt in about 2017 when I wanted to find out where some of these big orchestral and choral samples came from, so I started digging and ran into G-Boy's VGM Instrument Source Spreadsheet, or VIS for short, and the whole goal of this project is to find the origin of as many video game instrument sounds as possible. And so um, they already had an idea at that point of where these sounds came from, at least their original libraries, and so the string and orchestral sounds usually come from the ProSonus Orchestral Library, the orchestral strings in this case. And then the choir samples usually came from Peter Sielicek's, uh Hallelujah Chorus or Classical Choirs. And so I was so happy to have the original sources for these. By the way, they're both available today to purchase uh, from Big Fish Audio for the ProSona stuff and then from Best Service for the Peter Sielicek Complete Collection. And a neat note about the Peter Sielicek Collection is that it comes with the Advanced Orchestra, which if you're into the GameCube and Wii era Zelda games, that's all of your orchestral samples right there. So it's really neat between these two libraries. You have kind of a panorama of Zelda sounds. I will say that with the uh, ProSonus library, it doesn't include all of the original samples, but all of the vibes are absolutely there, and it's just a more updated version of some of those Zelda 64 strings, which is incredible that that's available today. Now, I went on my happy way collecting for a long period of time. I had so much fun with those libraries, and then I just started to go crazy and go down the spreadsheet. Um, I found sample libraries or synths that made really cool sounds. I wanted to see what other sounds they could make and how I could use them. And so after a few years, I had kind of collected what I wanted to collect. And uh, the pandemic was in full force at this period in time. So I jumped back in to see what was going on with the spreadsheet, what had been updated, what had been changed. I was actually really excited about it. And I was not expecting the level 
level of change that had happened at that point. So from multiple sources, a lot more info came out and basically Sample Cell came to the forefront as the main platform that would have been used at Nintendo. Uh, specifically, all of those ProSonus orchestral sounds and choir sounds would have come off of the Sample Cell factory library instead of their respective original libraries. And then the Gigapack, which also started to get cited a lot online, um, they had known there was a Roland format of it. There actually ended up being a Sample Cell format that came in three discs, so that exposed a whole bunch of other sounds that you know didn't have an origin before. Some of the sounds that we did know of lined up much better with their version on the Ultra Gigapack versus the original Gigapack. So this was amazing. And as someone who's interested in the historical or like the archival value of this, knowing where these sounds really came from like that in and of itself is amazing. What I was more excited about for is that it exposed the platform that all of this ran on. And that to me was incredible because that's going to be the machine that booted up every day. Not only that they got the sounds off of, but probably the machine that Koji Kondo did all the sequencing and composing on, um, probably where a lot of these sound banks were converted, at least at some level, you know, to a format that would eventually be on the Nintendo 64. This would have been the center of the studio at that time. Sample Cell 2 uh, in its new bus format released in 94, and it was originally spec'd for Quadras and Mac 2s. So these were really common at the time, and actually there was a uh, spike in sales of them in recording studios and music studios in general because Apple was actually reducing the prices. They had issues with sales during that particular time. And so a lot of studios that wouldn't have considered them otherwise um, all of a sudden were able to grab them. Now, obviously, Nintendo had money at this particular point in time, but I'm sure seeing other studios purchasing it, these would these would have been the common pick, a Mac 2 or a Quadra. But in 94, uh, specifically something really special happened, and that was that the first Power PC Max came out, the first Power Max. So there was a Japan exclusive release of the Power Mac 8100. I believe it was the 8115, if I remember correctly. And uh, that would have been an amazing, shiny, brand new option, especially for Nintendo at that point in time, uh, gearing up to build a full-blooded audio production studio for their new console that could handle full CD quality audio. Um, I don't necessarily know what the pick was or you know if it would have been a power Mac, but the cool thing about it, I guess, is that all three of these Macs, no matter what, would have been System 7 Macs at this time. So if you're interested in this, if you want to run a sample cell rig at some point, which we will do in a later video, we'll do the setup for that, um, any System 7 Mac is going to have the exact same experience with sample cell. Now there's two really cool photos that I want to call attention to, and these are really famous in the VGM community, but we have these two pictures of Koji Kondo and his studio one from the early 90s and one from the mid 2000s and the only tragic part about these photos is that they are just before and a little bit after the Nintendo 64 period. So unfortunately, we don't have a clear photo of what happened at that time. But the later photo actually has a lot of information for us because there's a lot of devices that would have been purchased during the Nintendo 64 era that have stuck around. There's a lot of mid 90s devices that are still there. And we are this close <laughs> to seeing whatever the sample cell rig would have been at that time. Of course, the, the main rig would have moved on. He was probably in an OS X uh, Mac Pro or MacBook Pro, something like that at that time. Uh, but the sample cell rig may have been just out of frame. In the upper left-hand corner of his rack here is a Opcode Studio 5 LX MIDI interface. I'm actually lucky enough to have one in my rack here as well. And this was a monster MIDI interface from about 93 or 94. Uh, would have connected over Mac serial ports and had uh, 15 ins and 15 outs of 16 channels each. So this would have been able to uh, control a rack of, of huge size. Obviously it could control everything that I've got here. No problem if I wanted to sequence from any of my older Macs or anything like that. And uh, it has stuck around all the way into 2005 and so it's very possible he's just using it to route the MIDI from his master controller to the rest of the synths and samplers in the rack uh, but I'd like to think that whatever Mac was in use is somewhere in this image either just in the rack or just out of frame or something like that. So I got inspired to find a sample cell rig, you know, or find the pieces of one basically and throw one together. I wanted to have a functional sample cell rig in my studio. Around this time period was when I found this sample cell 2 PCI card. I found a few more and I was looking at throwing together a slightly later G3 or G4 sample cell rig. Uh, the cards function identically and running in one of these later computers, everything's a bit faster and a bit easier to use. So I was okay with it from that perspective. But while I was searching, um, this monster showed up. This is a Quadra 840 AV, the fastest of the 68K Macs and a legend of its own in the vintage Mac community. 
I was both excited and super terrified when I saw one come up on eBay because they can be incredibly expensive. It booted, it had a sample cell and audio media card inside, and it was a perfect time capsule with a functional install of all the software needed to make it all run, even including the original discs and manuals. When I opened the package, I was happy to see that it made it to me all right, but it was in way worse condition than it appeared from the photos, and I had a strong hunch this was the case. It was amazing to see that it still ran with all the rust and dirt, and opening it up revealed it had been waterboarded slowly in the corner of a shed or garage for the past 30 years. Fun! (laughs) During testing, I also found that the original owner had written notation and finale, and then piped MIDI over to sample cell for playback, almost exactly the same way I did from finale to Pro Tools, with my East-West and Garreton libraries almost 15 years later. It was really interesting in general to see how little had actually changed. Sure, it was slower more beige than what I had used, but functionally it was pretty much identical. It managed to boot exactly three times, which was just enough to confirm the sample cell and audio media cards were functional, and then it gave me the sad Mac chime and would boot no more. Hours and hours went into this, cleaning, sanding, recapping, retrobriting, painting, and eventually getting the old nasty hard drive cloned onto a blue SCSI V2. After a few weeks, it was done back up and running, and as clean as it had been since 1993. And now it was time to write some music with it. This is one of those kind of special moments that's hard to describe. While this wasn't the machine used at Nintendo or anything like that, it was like being handed my hero's instrument, the very one used to record all of their hits. What would you even do in that situation? What would you play? Would it even matter, or would it even be possible to measure up to the expectation you've built over the years? I decided on something really simple, a short piece in four movements acting as vignettes of what I felt like as a kid playing some of my favorite games of all time with my family and friends. Koji Kondo's music for these games was the spark of inspiration for me to go to study music, later graduating from CU with a degree in double bass performance, and even getting to be the principal bassist for the Wyoming Symphony, Boulder Symphony, and working on so many incredible projects over the years. I didn't try to emulate Koji Kondo's writing or anything like that, more just act as if I was there, part of the team, responding to some of the same prompts and using the same tools. So, without further ado, I hope you enjoy 64 Adventures. <laughs> 